Nope. Thank you, everybody, for coming back. Hello. Clap once. Clap twice. Clap three times. It works with my five-year-old nephew, and it works with all of you. Really impressive. Um, anyone want to claim this? All right, Scott, I'll find you. Anyone want to claim a uh, adapter, iPhone? I, I took home sunglasses last year. Maybe I'll take home an adapter. Um, very quickly, I just want to take a moment to thank the folks that have served on the board and the exec slate during my tenure as president. So if you are one of those people, would you come join me on stage? If I were a better person, we would have presents. We don't have presents. But I just want to say thank you to this astonishing group of people. <laughs> they work their asses off. They get emails at 2 o'clock in the morning and they save the day. Uh, they do it with extraordinary charm and good humor and intelligence and camaraderie. And I am grateful to every second I have had as part of this organization since my first day as a member at Brian Quartz Toronto Conference. So thank you all for being who you are. Okay, so in the goal of keeping everything really short and on time, there is a bio for Mr. Luis Alfaro in your handbook and online, so if you have not read about him, I encourage you to do so. If you have not read his work, I encourage you to do so. If you have not seen his plays, please produce them and send him some royalty money. Um, <laughs> In addition to being a playwright and an activist, he is also sometimes a performer, and although tonight is not officially one of those performances, I am utterly delighted that he agreed to join us and give you just a little taste of who he is. Um, I have known Luis for a very long time and uh, had the luxury of dipping in and out of his work over many, many years. I made a list of just a few of them. Uh, Straight as a Line at Primary Stages in the year 2000, a play by a Latino playwright with an Asian cast. Uh, Electricidad at the Mark Taper Forum in 2004, and the film he wrote from Prada to Nada in 2011. So it's been um, a long journey of love to have this moment to get to share him with all of you. So with no further ado, I give you the extraordinary Luis Alfaro. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Oh, wow. I was so nervous about coming here to, today because uh, Lambda, it sounds like a British thing. But it's so great to see all of you. So many people I know. I want to thank Beth Blickers. We were both at, um, at Abrams Artists at the same time I was a client. And I was a terror client for that agency because I am a yes artist. I say yes to everything. And I, I have a really favorite memory, which was that I said yes to a tree plantain ceremony for the city of Anaheim, California. And I remember that they had to do the contract for that. And uh, it was really great. Um, uh, I just, uh, I think what I want to say is that, you know, although I work in the academy, I teach at USC, I, I really would just love to keep it really real. It's a short little speech, and um, I'm going to try to include as much gossip and, uh, as I can, uh, include some images, hopefully inspire some thoughts about new plays, development, community building. I have had a really sort of extraordinary journey these last, 
I'm, I'm afraid to say it, but I'm going to have to say it these last 30 years. Um, there's something about saying that, that, that number, and I think it's uh, that more and more I keep hearing this is a young man's game. So if you survive it, it's a gang culture. If I, if I got through the last uh, first 20 years, I think I can get through all of it. So I'm super excited that nobody's going to shoot me here tonight. I'm really happy. I was raised very Pentecostal and very Catholic, so essential to a uh, key to my work is this I think I, uh, a sense of humility, a sense of appreciation for, um, for these opportunities. And I have a lot of opportunities right now in my life. I am the resident playwright at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. I was just, uh, yeah, it's a great gig. <laughs> I, um, I am a resident artist at the Magic Theater in San Francisco, at Victory Gardens Theater in Chicago a uh, little company in LA called Playwright Serena. And really kind of not because I, I want to, but I think it's the new reality of how we work. It used to be in the old days when I first started, you were at one theater and, and there was a kind of loyalty at one theater, right? And it doesn't work like that anymore. You kind of go around the country, you're kind of a, a bit of a nomad. And so I have spent the last 30 years kind of traveling around the US and I do something a little different, which is that I don't um, just show up, you know, for table work. And then, uh, and then, you know, you leave at the end of rehearsal and then come back for opening. And then that next morning, that 6 a.m. Southwest flight that they put you on and send you home. Um, I actually stay. I stay. So I have been doing a series of what I call long-term residencies at regional theaters across America. I stay for up to a year. And I stay normally in kind of cities that are wrestling with something with themselves. So I was in Tucson, Arizona for a year. I was in Hartford, Connecticut for a year. Um, I was uh, in Houston, Texas for a year. So I've been kind of all over the country. And um, one of the realities that I face as a, as a person of color doing theater in the regional theaters is that I not only bring my play, I also bring the audience with me, or I go and find them. And so I thought today I'd tell you a little bit about how I do that, and also how I, uh, how I work inside of a company. I have these little tricks, you know, um, a box of donuts works really, really well. I am a notorious for bringing that first box of donuts to the box office. And generally when I come to a company, I start at the box office, and then I move into marketing. And then when we start working on the art, I work, I move into literary. And so it's a, a way of um, making sure that the signal we're giving to the community is the one we want to give. Uh, it's also a way of uh, making sure that when you have that first experience uh, coming to a theater, it's the most positive experience you can have. So I am kind of crazy about things like working with the parking lot guy. Um, working with the people who do facilities, because I do think that's where the first experience starts. It starts with having a really good parking lot experience so that you want to come back, yeah? Um, I'm the most ignorant person in the room. That's uh, the title of today's speech. I am uh, the most ignorant person in the room. That's where I start. This is where I learn uh, that I need to be told everything about a community. So when I go to a new community, I do something that I learned from a woman named Rachel Ray, who's a TV host, a food host, yeah? And she says that she goes to these uh, different cities and she'll say, hey, where's the best place for me to have breakfast? And if three people tell her the same place, then that's the place, that's the local place, right? I do a little variation on that. Who should I talk to? And so that's where it starts. And it's not usually the mayor. It's usually that guy that does activism work or this lady who is keeping these things together in town or somebody who is kind of like the town gossip. Um, whoever it is, they usually are the first entrance into a community. I am trying my best in my work to be as authentic and as truthful in the creation of the work, not only for the audience, but most of the time I am working with the community that are in essence kind of my dramaturgs. Um, I was born and raised in downtown Los Angeles in a very poor and a very violent neighborhood called Pico Union. I generally don't like to tell this story because I used to have a lot of shame about it, but I'm going to tell you because I think it's really important as to how I started. Um, so my mom is at uh, Born Again Pentecostal, is at prayer service. It's a Wednesday night. 
My dad is at the Hollywood Park racetrack, and I am babysitting my little sister. There is a bar at the corner called it Club Jalisco, and there is a fight at the bar. Um, I know this because a guy is walking down the street with a piece of a pool cue sticking out of his stomach, and he starts to walk towards our house, and lo and behold, he falls and dies in front of the house. Our dog, Toro, later to be renamed Tortilla when he got run over, jumps on this guy and starts to bite him. And there is panic, there is chaos, there is uh, police lights, there is ambulances, there's all kinds of stuff. Now, what, what I think is happening, even though I don't know the word yet, is there is opera. There is something extraordinary going outside, on outside at that window. And it is the beginning of my journey towards storytelling. So guess what? I was in the fourth grade, and we had to write an essay, and it was just lucky that that happened. Most important thing that happened in your neighborhood. <laughs> so I write this wonderful essay about this guy and the pool cue and my dog and the ambulance lights, and I'm you know, already using metaphor. It's like a circus, and you know, I'm going on and on and on. And um, so my mother gets called in by my teacher who has read it. Uh, my mother and I have to go visit the principal who uh, suspends me for a week, and I have to see a therapist. So, uh, wonderful, right? And uh, here's the thing that's so amazing about it. I uh, was raised by two farm worker parents from the Central Valley of California, Delano. And so we were raised in the United Farm Workers, kind of political family. And my father used to say to us when we were kids, um, we must bring to light that which is in the dark which is abuses, which is oppression, which is all this stuff. And in that moment, when I am in that principal's office, I realize that somebody is trying to stop me from telling the truth. Yeah? And so it's the beginning of writing for me. Uh, my mother went and bought me a bunch of little books, and I started to journal write, and I never stopped. Uh, it was the beginning of an uh, in intro into poetry. I spent 10 years in the poetry world, and then I spent another 10 years doing performance art uh, in the US. I went to Europe, I went to Canada, I went to Latin America, and I'll just very quickly tell you that the, the theater of performance art was also a way into discovering theater. So I have two famous pieces. I'm looking at Meat Hunter because I think he's seen them both in a disgusting manner. I drink a bottle of tequila on stage and then I work out. Um, so a uh, kind of crazy uh, statement on machismo and uh, how much can my body take and, and I call them these modern vaudevilles. And the other one is I eat two boxes of Twinkies and then I tightrope walk. And so uh, I know you're thinking, hmm, okay, who did they get for the keynote? But it did get me to Europe, right? <laughs> And he got me a MacArthur Award, so. <laughs> uh, but that was really just the beginning for seeing my art really kind of in two ways. I think of my playwriting life as uh, my life before Marie Irene Fornes and my life after meeting Irene. So I was a student of Irene Fornes, says, and it changed my life. Um, in many ways, um, I belong to an ancient tradition. I don't have any formal education in terms of the arts. So I was really, I come from that ancient tradition of mentoring. I was mentored by Irene. Uh, at a certain point, Irene said, now you must go to Paula Vogel. So I was Paula Vogel's assistant for a while, and I was mentored by her. Paula sent me off to Mac Wellman. That was very, very interesting. <laughs> In fact, I'll tell you my little well, Mac Wellman story because I got gossip. I have to do a little gossip, right? So Mac and I are at a bar in LA called uh, El Coyote. And yeah, but dangerous, dangerous margaritas. I'm underage, but I have a, uh, I have a fake idea, so it's all okay, right? And um, I'm wasted. And he hands me a napkin and he says, you're not very well read and it's going to haunt you for the rest of your life. So I suggest that you read this list and you start reading all these pieces. And on the list, the first listing is the Bible, <laughs> and it's the Quran, and then it was like Tennessee Williams. I mean, it kind of just went down the list, right? And um, maybe one of the greatest gifts I ever have, and the Mac uh, uh, turned me on to Len Jenkins. And and there I went for the next 10 years, working uh, nonstop. So a lot of what I did was I would assist people in exchange for being in their workshops or for uh, being in the room with them. Um, I feel like everyone that I work with is capable of writing a great play. 
and I talk about children, I talk about community members that I work with and senior citizen groups, I feel that everyone can write a great play. I feel that everyone can write a, probably a great song, a great poem, but very few of us can write 10 of them because that requires this, right? And all that writing is is really about technique and craft. So for me, the alchemy of writing really happened in playwriting. It really happened when I committed that thing, uh, my, my sort of Chicano tongue, to a pen and it landed on a very kind of American paper. And somehow I've been sort of wrestling with one foot on each side of the border. And sometimes the border is the US and Mexico, but a lot of times the border is between um, being a queer and being in a straight culture, being a person of color, and being in institutions where I'm the only person of color. So a lot of times, you know, I'm, I'm having to sort of negotiate a lot of, a lot of this. So my first class with Irene Forness was with an amazing group of people. Han Ong, I don't know if you guys know Han Ong, Bridget Carpenter, Naomi Izuka, Caridad Svich, Alice Tuan, and Irene asked what kind of play I wanted to write. And uh, so I had, by then, already uh, had 16 arrests for civil disobedience. I, I'm a political person. And, uh, and at one point, I even worked for the ACLU teaching people how to get arrested. And I blurted out that I wanted to write political plays. And Irene Fornes says, ugh, I hate people who write political plays. <laughs> the irony, right? And I didn't know her work, but it was like, OK. And she said, if you want to write a, a political play, I suggest that you stop writing right now and that you go do your work, go do politics, and then come back and write a play about nothing, write a play about a rock, and I promise you it will be political. A cliche, I know, um, but it was, um, it was a truth that really helped me, so I stopped writing. I worked in HIV AIDS prevention uh, in a hospice, and then I did field work. I had a job where from midnight to 5 a.m. I would go to Griffith Park, which is the largest park in LA County, and I had a flashlight, and I was that super obnoxious guy that would go into the bushes and go, hey, are you guys about to have sex? Because uh, do you need a condom? And uh, do you know how to put it on? Because I could teach you, I have a banana. And I had a little safe sex show I did. And so, um, so true to performance art, but true also to my activism and theater, right? And so I was doing a lot of this stuff. And then I went to work for SEIU, the, the largest union in the country, on a Justice for Janitors campaign. And I came back, and I did exactly what Irene Fornes asked me to do, which is to write about nothing. And of course, the world entered, right? And my career took off. So I spent 10 years at the Mark Taper Forum. I ran a program called the Latino Theater Initiative, commissioned over 150 artists. Um, and then I ran the new play development for a while. And like all good things, regime change happens and it ends. And this is the challenge with the American theater. At the moment when you finally learn how to be a good producer, you get canned, right? So uh, I, I was sort of lost. I didn't really know what to do. And as Beth was telling you, I got hired to write a tween film, an adaptation of Sense and Sensibility called From Prada to Nada. And the woman I was working with was a, a French Venezuelan filmmaker named Fina Torres. And, uh, you know, we were working, they put us up at a house in Ojai, California, and I was sort of depressed. You know, I'd worked, I think, all of my life. I think I had only taken one day off during my entire time at the taper. And uh, she said, what's the matter? I said, well, you know, I'm not sure I missed a job, but I sure miss all the people. And being a French rude woman, she said, the only thing that art asks you to do is to change. Get over yourself. And it was the best lesson for going into long-term residencies, which sometimes can be a little lonely, which sometimes when you're working in cities that are struggling, you meet a lot of different kinds of people. Uh, so I did a poverty study in Hartford, Connecticut, as many of you might know. Uh, do you guys know Hartford, Connecticut? So Hartford State, so Hartford, you know, quadruples in size during the day, but at night it's 43% Puerto Rican and 40 something percent African American. Um, huge uh, drug addiction problem. So I spent my days at the local parish with the priest in the poorest parish in Hartford, and Hartford is the poorest city in the richest state in, in the nation. And so, um, you know, I would sit there and people would come in and they would uh, ask him to do final rites or they would want to rent the hall for $10. And so it was like a kind of amazing experience to just sit 
and know nothing and to learn everything about a city. Um, I was in Tucson, uh, Tucson Arizona, at working at Borderlands Theater, and Elaine Romero's here, who has been a long, long time playwright friend, and I did a project where I worked with young teen girls, and I met a little girl, 13 years old, who had murdered her mother. It was a poetry uh, program in uh, like a juvenile a juvenile uh, detention center. And she had murdered her mother because the mother had put a hit out on the dad, who was a, dr a drug dealer from the south side of Tucson. And so, terrible, terrible story. A beautiful young lady, a great poet. And so that night I would go to the Arizona Theater Company to see a play, and I remember it was a comedy. It was called The Mystery of Irma Vep. And so I needed something to raise my spirits. And I went into the little Arizona Theater Company store, and they had a collection of the Greeks, which I had never read. Ten Greeks for ten dollars. Dollar a Greek, pretty good, right? And the first uh, uh, play that I read is Electra, the story of a young girl who murders her mother to avenge her father's death. And something shifts in me, right? I'm going to tell this story beat per beat, and I'm going to keep it modern, but I'm going to take all of those beats of the Greeks, and I'm going to teach myself how to write a really good play in 90 minutes with life and love and death and family and all the good stuff. And, uh, and it sent me on a journey. So for the last 10, 10 years or so, I've written uh, four Greeks. I wrote a play called Electricidad that was done on the main stage at the Goodman, Mark Taper Forum. Uh, I wrote a play called Oedipus El Rey that's uh, been all over the country. And then uh, most recently, I wrote uh, an adaptation of Medea called Bruja for the Magic Theater. And then, because I'm a glutton for punishment, I wrote another version of Medea called Mojada, which is kind of really making its way around the country. So I thought today that I would show you a little bit through image, because, you know, I'm not that beautiful, uh, through image, some of the programs that I do, how I do them, and you can get a sense of how I travel through the theater. And, uh, and since, since we have so few moments, I thought I'd kind of like plow through this. And so forgive me if, uh, if I'm kind of going a little too fast. So. Um, this is a project that I did in Santa Barbara. Uh, teen, young teen gang members with senior citizens, six months. The senior citizens play the kids, the kids play the senior citizens. One of the most extraordinary experiences, I'll tell you why, I had a, a young guy, his name was Oso, which in Spanish means bear, and he uh, decided at the first rehearsal that nobody in the gang was going to come to rehearsal. Ha! <laughs> what do you do about that, right? So I'm sitting in Santa Barbara, which is about two hours out of LA, trying to figure out what to do. I'm at a Starbucks, and I wait till 10 p.m., and I go to Oso's house, knock on the door. His mother answers, and I say, hola, esta osito? So I have to take him down a few notches, right? And um, she's, blah, blah, blah. and so she sends me upstairs. He doesn't know I'm coming. He opens the door. There he is in his boxers and his undershirt, and I said, so here's the deal. I know that you want to be in charge, and I don't need to be in charge. Uh, right now I'm listed as the director, but you can be the director. I will tell you everything you need to do, and you will get the credit in the program. But you have to guarantee that the, the young gang members will show up to every rehearsal and they'll never be late. And sure enough, six months, not a single absence, not a single tardy. And when people were like racing, also would get on his little phone and say, get here. And they would get there, right? So one of the greatest accomplishments that I learned early on was how to negotiate with community. And I love the program because the program says directed by Oso, assisted directed by Luis Alfaro. <laughs> And this little lady, her name is China, is the dramaturg. And so I was hoping she'd be here today, but clearly she hasn't followed the craft. Um, uh, in my journeys, I also do a lot of crazy things like playwriting workshops with the red-hatted ladies of Palm Springs. Isn't that fabulous? Uh, so I started, to, I started to work and build plays, and one of the plays that I built was a play called Breakfast, Lunch, and Dinner about a woman who gets so impossibly large that she starts to float. Uh, it had always been my dream to, to make theater that's fantastical, that's impossible, and I went to a bunch of directors because I was this young, arrogant guy, a new dramatist, and I would interview directors, right? And I'd say, can you make somebody float on stage? And then, you know, like, I don't know, like Annie Kaufman would say no, and they'd go, 
next. And so Lisa Peterson said, yes, I will make your floating person. So we worked on this piece. This is Diane Rodriguez, who is president of the TCG board and now on the National Council of the Arts. She'd be thrilled that I'm showing this picture of her. <laughs> and that equaled um, this play at Hartford Stage. So I kind of got to see my fat woman fly. And it was really kind of extraordinary. But the thing that was most extraordinary about this was going and working with the box office. Because when you have 43% Puerto Ricans in town, you need a Spanish-speaking box office person. And maybe the biggest activism I did at Hartford was hire a Spanish-speaking box office person who's still there 10 years later. And so little by little, that is the kind of politics that take over. So although I see these images and I think about how much fun this play was, I think about creating access for the audience to enter into the world of the play. And then I went to Oregon Shakespeare Festival to do this play. This is Sandra Marquez, the newest member of Steppenwolf Ensemble. Um, if you guys know Sandra, she's not this big at all. She's super thin. Um, and uh, this is one of my favorite pictures. Louis Douth at the, uh, is here from OSF as well. And um, we had an amazing journey 10 years ago, which has said, uh, my boss, Bill Rausch, told me, we need to get the numbers, to change the numbers. And if we're doing a Latino play, we need to see Latinos. So he gave me 10,000 tickets at a discounted price. I went into town. I had an office, not at the uh, Oregon Shakespeare Festival, but at a place called La Clinica del Valle in two towns over. And uh, La Clinica del Valle is where all the migrant farm workers go. And I learned things, which I love as a playwright, which is I learned things about states. So Oregon is an organic state. They don't put anything in their water that's not organic to the water. So they don't have fluoride. Uh, that summer, a young 11-year-old migrant farm worker died of a tooth abscess. So that started to fuel a whole ton of stories. And when you're in a clinic, you're learning this, all of this in really immense and profound ways. But the other exciting thing is Freda Casillas, who is our community outreach person, and I went to Medford, and we found this woman who had this taco truck. And we said to her, um, would you come? And she said, no, I'd never make any money. So we guaranteed her $3,000 as she would come for our big Latino opening weekend. And we had a, a conjunto that we brought from Sinaloa. We like really built this thing up, right? And so she agreed to come and she made $10,000 that first weekend. So now she is an institution, Taco Truck Tuesday at OSF. Uh, we had to take it off the bricks because the Shakespeare purists were really, really mad. So now it's over by the new theater. She's joined the uh, Hispanic Chamber of Counts, uh, Count Commerce, and she gives us 10% of all into the Hispanic Scholarship Fund. We can do it, right? We can write the play. We can bring the audience, and we can bring the taco truck. <laughs> <laughs> so I read that 5% of all plays for young people, only 5% have a female lead. I don't know if that's true. Is it? Does anyone know if that's still true? So I wrote a play called Black Butterfly. It has a really long title. Took it to the Kennedy Center twice. And it was a big hit. Um, uh, just wrote it on a lark, really, because I was so dismayed by the fact that most young girls in plays support the little boy who goes on the journey, right? So could we have five females talking about being poets? And this play has had about 13 productions, and it was seen in LA by 135,000 kids, right? You can do it. Uh, here's another kind of activism. I wrote a play called Hero uh, right after the Iraq War. Comedy, I read about a guy from La Habra, California, who fell off uh, his truck while he was protecting water in Iraq, and he got the key to the city. And I was like, wait a minute, I want the key to La Habra, California, right? So I wrote this silly little comedy. We started rehearsing, Latino cast. Um, we noticed that all the reservations are only Latino. So the next day, John Rivera, the director, hires an Asian cast. So on Thursday nights, Latino cast. Friday nights, Asian cast. Saturday, Latinos. Sunday, Asians. <laughs> And you know what happened? Only the Latinos would come to the Latino show, only the Asians came to the Asian show. So we had to mix the moms. And the minute that happened, diverse audience. Yeah? What a lesson. 
uh, I wrote a play for Cornerstone Theater Company called Body of Faith. This is a great lesson about playwriting. Um, gay and lesbian, transgender, LBGTQ. Did you know there's a Q? What is it? Questioning. I didn't know. And I'm gay. <laughs> I could be thrown out of the tribe for that. So um, I wrote this play. I interviewed people of faith, uh, lesbian nuns, everybody. And I met two transgender people. And one of the transgender people in the play told me that he was from San Antonio, she was from San Antonio, Texas, and um, was going to jump off a bridge, so depressed. And the parents came, the fire department was there, it was a big, big thing in the news. And uh, the mother's crying and she says, don't jump, we love you, we know you're gay. And she says, I'm, it, I'm not gay, I'm a woman, I'm transgender. And the mother says, jump. <laughs> so, right, so like core beliefs, right? And she says, that is the moment when I realized that the only thing that was gonna get me through this journey of changing my body was faith. So the T in transgender is the same T in transformation. It's the same T in transubstantiation. I got in so much trouble with the Catholic Church. I got a note from my parish telling me they were gonna kick me out. It was amazing, but you know what? Nuns came, priests came, and I didn't realize we had so many gay and lesbian uh, nuns and priests in LA County. Extraordinary. And it won the Penn Award for drama, thank God. So here I go into the Greeks. Um, I love what happened, and I started in Tucson at a little theater called Borderlands. And I really loved working at Borderlands because although it's a non-professional theater, writing a new play for a non-professional theater requires a lot of craziness, like people not showing up, and n nobody ever kind of really actually learned all the lines. <laughs> but the thing that was extraordinary was I needed to get the essence and the authenticity of the language. And that is what that community gave me. They gave it to me. This is a Pima Community College where we ended up doing the play. And they gave me this wonderful gift, and that's what equaled a main stage production at the Goodman Theater. Um, it was a very interesting experience at the Goodman because it was, I think, the first, outside of Zoot Suit and a few others, the first kind of large-scale Latino new play. And I'll never, uh, Tanya Siracho, do you guys know the playwright Tanya Siracho? She's a good friend of mine. We were at the box office because she was in the play, she was in the chorus, and a person came up, a very innocent, wonderful, older woman who didn't realize it, but went up and said, is this play in Spicanese? And the box office guy said, mm, oh, you know, he's wrestling with that, right? And, and she goes, you know, Spicanese, when it's like Spanish and English. And he goes, I don't think that's a word, right? And uh, <laughs> it was basically my experience of how powerful it was to be at a big, gigantic theater like at the Goodman and also to educate the audience. So I started to do post plays, and now I believe really strongly in post plays. And so I did kind of a post play every other night. Um, uh, just to, so these are uh, stills from the play. Um, and then there was a production at the Mark Taper Forum. I'm just going to go really quick through them because my minutes are up. Lots of productions everywhere. Dallas! Uh, the old LA City Jail. How scary was that? Of uh, the first deaf production. Fabulous, right? So I went into Oedipus El Rey. The thing I love about the Greeks is there's a question we're asking, right? So if Electra, the question of Electra is, is it possible for us to forgive? The question of Oedipus is, is it destiny or is it fate, right? And so I read that 62% uh, of all young men in the California state prison system uh, will go back at least once into prison once they're released. 62%. Where are the new kingdoms? Yeah? So we started at the Magic Theater with a very simple kind of staging of the play, moved into Victory Gardens Theater Chicago. This is the eighth production of the play, and as a playwright I have to say, um, this is finally where the play landed. So it takes me a long time, usually first productions are not really kind of my favorite, or I'm still working. It, there was a character named uh, Creon, Creon, se cree muy Creon, which is a play on Creon. And um, I never kind of got that character. And every review, seven productions previous, would say, mm, something's wrong with the Creon. And then, you know, you meet an actor. And he brings something to the experience. And it was a young guy just out of DePaul. And he would sit at rehearsal with this little pad. And he would write the most amazing notes. 
thoughts for himself as a character, and something switched for me too. And it was the first time that I met an actor who actually wrote his part. He didn't actually give me the language, but he gave me the soul of this character. And then uh, this play really took off. It was like Chris Jones's uh, only four stars that I ever got from him. It went, and it ran all summer and it, got, and it got picked up everywhere. So here was my experience in Chicago, 35 performances. Every day, I'd get up in the morning, and I'd take a subway, like the Kedzie line, all the way to its end, and then I would take a bus all the way to its end, and then I would walk about 10 blocks in the 95-degree heat, and I'd shave my head. I did all kinds of crazy stuff just to, like, survive it. And um, I would go meet a nonprofit leader that was working with issues around uh, young men just out of prison, gang prevention, and then that night, they would come to the theater and they would be my guest at the, at the post play. So we show up for first performance, and the audience, beautiful audience, is about um, 65 and older, uh, white, uh, very loyal, but doesn't look like the city, right? So I got up, and I went out front, and I said, you guys, we have to do something about this, because I have a play that has all these young people in it, and young people are not going to see it. So, is it possible for everybody in here to buy a ticket for a young kid, give it to the young kid, or I will give it to the young kid, and we will bring, and we will just, we will make an intergenerational audience overnight. $1,200 first night. Next night, 45, 50 young people. Sold out show for the rest of its run. The most mixed audience in the world. Yes. Yes. So this is one of my favorite productions because um, I think it just, it, the audience was changed and I was changed. So here's my sad story about casting. The most amazing actor, he's having the most amazing career in Chicago. His name's Adam Poss. Have you ever seen him? I saw him because I saw him in a Rajiv Joseph play at Theater Works in uh, Palo Alto. And um, uh, he came into audition. I said, I'm sorry. I'm so, I feel terrible about this, but I'm going to ask to you not to audition because I'm really working towards a kind of authenticity with play and I'm really looking for Latinos. And he goes, well, you know what? I've never played a Latino and I'm Puerto Rican. And I go, oh my God, I've seen you in like three Rajiv Joseph plays. He goes, I did a lot of good accent work at DePaul. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so a kind of amazing journey with this actor. He's in kind of everything I do now in Chicago, right? So not only am I building the play, I'm building the audience, I'm building the community of actors as well. The only way we're gonna be good enough for these regional theaters is if we, we become veterans in the field. A uh, production in Minneapolis with Carlisle Brown as Theresias. Oh, how, how amazing is that? Yeah? A uh, uh, woolly mammoth, a uh, big lesson I learned, uh, Eastern European designer. He says to me, what's your favorite TV show? I go, America's Next Top Model, I love it. And, uh, <laughs> He brings in this set, this set design, and uh, he took out all the chairs, if you can notice up there, and he built a ramp, a modeling ramp, and the entire place took place on this ramp. So you have to be very careful about what you tell designers. <laughs> This is the famous uh, road rage scene in, in Oedipus. So that was the drawing, and this was the actual design. Um, I learned a big lesson. The audience was terrified. You must never sit them that close when there's blood and violence. They were, um, they were beyond terrified. Uh, I never saw a single person of color at their production, and the poor, you know, I love Willie Mammoth, God bless them, but the, the crowd that came was like, oh my God, I can never go to the inner city. <laughs> it was terrifying for them. This was the set. 
Uh, so one of my greatest experiences working at uh, Regional Theater, Woolly Mammoth, uh, while I'm doing Oedipus, I'm also working with 12 adult um, uh, people in a, y, in a YMCA program, a uh, literacy program, learning how to read and write for the first time in their lives. They come to first rehearsal. They come to table work. They come to design meetings. They come to opening night, and they come throughout the run. And uh, they learn uh, to read and write with a play called Oedipus El Rey. How fabulous is that? Yeah? I'm so damn lucky. This woman gave me a lot of trouble. <laughs> You can almost tell with the ones that give you trouble, right? <laughs> uh, production here, I, I wanted to show you this because this is a production here in Portland and uh, with wonderful Olga, is Olga here? Is Olga here? That's Olga Sanchez, the wonderful, <laughs> who's taken a breather from uh, acting to get her PhD. Fabulous, fabulous. Fabulous. Uh, Seattle, uh, uh, Denver, not Denver, yeah, Dem uh, no, Dallas Theater Works. And uh, then um, a production recently in San Diego. So, um, and, then I, and then I started working on this Medea. How crazy is that? This actress I met when she was 12 years old. Her mother is the famous land water rights activist, Maria Varela. We met at a MacArthur gathering. And she said, my daughter, this is my daughter, Sabina, and she wants to be an actress. And you're like, all oh, right, OK, good luck. <laughs> she shows up a few years later in my life, and she's my student at USC. And then um, I find out that she had done uh, Electricidad at the New Mexico Arts Festival. And then she did Oedipus at Dallas Theater Center. And then she played Medea in this play. So she's done all my work. Um, that's the way we built community. That's the way we built actors. This is a guy named Sean San Jose who has a company called Campo Santo, the legendary company of San Francisco. We've done 18 works together. Some people just get you, right? And then, of course, I decided to do another Medea because um, I didn't really think the one I wrote was good enough, really. And so I, met, I went back to Chicago and I started to meet these people called the Dreamers, people who hang out on the street and they counsel people who are undocumented about where you can get uh, services, everything, right? Um, how to avoid getting arrested. And um, I write this piece in the middle of this play uh, based on this woman's narrative. Um, so then another piece of information pops up to me like the Greeks give you, right? More than half of all women who cross into the US undocumented from Latin America are assaulted. Most of the time they're raped. What a terrible price to pay to come into this country, right? So I decided I wasn't gonna take a stand on immigration because it was, it was uh, like people were very dramatic about it. Senator Dick Durbin came and did one of my post plays and we decided that what we were gonna do was try to not talk numbers of people, but show you the humanity of people who are undocumented in this country. So could we just show you what it is to live undocumented in America? And that is the journey of this play. It's all the beats of Medea. The other thing when you're looking for authenticity is the house. So I spent months and months in Pilsen, which is the Mexican-American neighborhood of Chicago, and I started taking pictures of houses because I knew I wanted the house to look oh, the way that my audience might really buy into it. So this was the original design that, you know, of the picture of an actual house that I found in Chicago. And then the amazing set designer, you know, of course, did her magic. And you know what's interesting? The minute that sometimes when your people walk into a theater and they go, oh yeah, okay. And then they sit down and they don't do this, but they do this, right? Extraordinary. And that was design. Uh, thank you to Norman Frisch, who's also here. I all my friends are here, I'm so excited. Uh, Norman Frisch, I don't know if you guys know Norman. Do Norman, stand, and, yeah, there's Norman. Norman, uh, uh, yeah, he's the big wig. <laughs> I don't think I'd be doing the Greeks if it wasn't for Norman. Uh, he worked at the Getty, and he got me interested in telling these Greek stories, and I went up there, and I met these scholars that were extraordinary, and once again, he came to San Francisco, and he saw Bruja, and he thought I could do better. I think uh, you asked some pretty pointed questions that were that were kind of critical, but sweet, and then, <laughs> I'm just messing with them, right? And, uh, and then, uh, 
this, this production, this big production just happened and we just won the Los Angeles Drama Critics Circle Award and it won the Jeff Award for Best Play. So it's had a kind of, and it's opening at Oregon Shakespeare Festival next season. And then at the end of next year, it'll be at Portland Center Stage. So finally, this is a good example of, um, of another great lesson I learned. Aesop in Rancho Cucamonga, you get hired by a city to write a play for children, and it has to include Aesop, and you have to meet the city's founding fathers, and they're gonna take you all their museums, and, uh, and you still don't have enough creativity to get through it. And nothing was sort of kicking in, and they said, we have this Native American woman named Barbara who wants to meet you. Can you go to the hot dog on a stick at Rancho, whatever, the mall, Victoria Garden, and she's going to meet you at hot dog on a stick. And there she is, a hot dog on a stick. And she says, hi, I'm, I work with the Native community. I hear you doing this play. I have two requests. The play, if it's for children, should not feature humans. It should be animals. I go, okay, that, all right. She goes, we all have animal spirits, right? And then she goes, the other thing is, I have to take you and show you our herbs. So I was like, all right, woo. So, okay, so we get in the car, and we go to the 210 freeway entrance ramp. She pull over, we get off, all the cars are getting on the freeway, and she's picking the herbs, and we're eating the herbs that were originally there. And something about the idea of reaching under and looking to see what's underneath the city, started this play. So I wrote this crazy play about a little bear named Aesop, whose family dies in, a, in the big Foothill fire. The parents were super pissed. Uh, that's a picture of the actual Foothill that went up in flames, so it was based on a true story. And um, she, there's her clan, and they do this rap when they come out, and then the fire comes and they all leave except for her. And then I just started working with all these Native American images that belong to the Tongva tribe of that region, Rancho Cucamonga. So every night, the moon dies so that we can have a new day, so that the sun can come up. So the moon speaks like this. <gasps> you thought I was, I don't know, the parents were livid, right? Now I'm, I'm doing bears, I'm doing death. I mean, they like, they're, and of course, we started doing nighttime shows for the parents. The parents wept, because of course what happened is in the middle of this, my father died. And I didn't know how to process anything other than the day that my father died, I went to rehearsal, because that's how crazed I was. And I didn't know where to take all this grief and this sorrow. So I wrote this play about a little bear that has to be confronted with loss and grief. So she meets these uh, retired lizards who take her in. She meets uh, these cactus, 100-year-old cactus that tell her about the history of Rancho Cucamonga. Um, she meets the salmon, she meets ants, she meets everybody, right? And in the process of um, meeting them, they all do this crazy little ritual that we learned from the They learn the entire play. How amazing is that? So I, I'm pretty sure my time is up, but I think what I want to leave you with this, I'm doing Pentecostal plays now. Look at me, it's so sad. Um, so I would like to leave you with one last thought. So I did, a, um, when I was doing Oedipus, I met uh, Father Greg Boyle of Homeboy Industries, which is a gang prevention center in Los Angeles. And he said, I have your Oedipus. I want you to come meet him. And it was a guy who had just gotten out of something called the SHU, Solitary Holding Unit in prison. He had been in it for 16 years. I'm his first, like, client that he's going to meet in a room with no windows. I go in. The guy is completely tattooed, and he won't look at me. He's completely socially awkward. And he tells me that when he was a kid, he was in a gang called the Wilma's Gang, Wilmington, California. 
they were going to kill his brother, and the uh, opposing gang said, if you sh kill somebody else, we're going to let your brother live. So he got a gun, and he went to a street corner in Wilmington, and he shot an old lady waiting for a bus. And he went to prison. In prison, he had a fight, and he murdered a guy in prison. So he was put in this solitary holding unit. So from the age of 16 to 32, right? So he says, I say, wow, that's interesting. So, and you know me, I'm like a playwright. So I'm like, do you know women? And he's like, no, I'm a virgin. Because, well, of course, right? And I go, do you like, what was your family? I never knew my mother. And I said, oh, this is like extraordinary. He's telling me all this stuff. I go, have you ever heard of the play Oedipus? And he's like, no. And so and I tell him the whole story. And he goes, well, I know destiny and fate. I know destiny of fate, because what happened is I had the same guard the entire time I was in prison, an old African-American man who said to me, when you get out, I'm going to retire and leave with you. And sure enough, the, they tell you two weeks in advance. They give you that extra pair of shoes. They give you $150. They give you a bus voucher. They give you the, your stuff. And waiting outside of the gates was the guard who had retired and the guard was waiting for him, and the guard said, can I hug you? And he said, I have, I know, I don't know the touch of another person. I don't know a woman, I didn't, never knew my mother, nobody ever touched me, I don't know that. So the guard said, I'm gonna show you what redemption feels like. And he hugs him, and he said, and I started crying, and I must have cried for an hour, and all I was thinking about was how all my uh, spit was on this guy's shoulder, and he goes, and I knew in that moment, that I understood that I had to take responsibility for my life and that I would never come back to prison. So it's the most extraordinary thing when you're a playwright to meet the character you're writing and he's sitting in front of you and he gives you the story. And all you have to do is channel. All you have to do is transcribe. All you have to do is translate. It is what I love about community. I am the most ignorant person in the room. All I have to do is listen. And he gave me this amazing, amazing gift. And uh, so every Friday when I leave USC, I go down to Home Girl Cafe. It's a cafe for like ex cholas. And it's terrible. The service is terrible because, you know, like they're ex gang girls, so they don't give a crap. And uh, so you go there, and there's the guy who's part of the Speakers Bureau with his tattoos the tattoo of his mother, tattoo of his father, tattoo of his brother. And you realize that he is a canvas. And that is, he carries his history with him. How extraordinary. I found my Oedipus. We can do it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much to Luis Alfaro. Thank you to Louis from OSF for making this possible. Thank you all for staying and listening. Thank you so much. Can I just say, I think, you know, the thing is, I, I, you know, I, think I always have trouble, like, when I do these things, because I'm in a room usually with, like, people who are, you know, in jails and stuff, so it's, a, like, a kept audience, right? A captive audience. But I think what's so extraordinary is just look out here, Mead, Norman, Louis, uh, all, so many of you I've known over so many years. We are on a journey together. I know that we're not always at the same theater, but I think it is extraordinary that we are part of this ancient tradition and we're still doing the work. Isn't that amazing? And that when we feel like we can't do it, we have to remember that we're part of a very special tribe. We're the translators, right? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. End of day one. I think we got through it. Um, you're on your own for the rest of the evening. Anyone who wants to come to Rogue Hall and kick your evening off with a drink, please do. Anyone who wants to head to dinner and then come join at Rogue Hall, you're welcome to do that. Uh, have a great time. Ask the volunteers if you need help with anything, and we will see you back here at, I think, 9.30 tomorrow morning. Anybody leave?